Hey -o, how's it going guys? Who's in here? Sorry uh, if I also, sorry if I scratch my face in this live cast. I totally touched a plant that I shouldn't have. Uh, but hey, now I know I'm allergic to uh, Vesuvius uh, ferns. <laughs> Vesuvius Amazon ferns. Uh, let's see here. John Gonzalez, what's up? Uh, Oddball Aquatics, good to see you as always. Uh, Sunwise, hello. Um, do, 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 do. Jeff Griffin, hello. Mr. D's Tank, some more. Hey, everybody. So we'll wait for people to pile in here a little bit, but today, feel free to ask me any question you want, uh, be it fish related or otherwise. Shrimp me, whatever, uh, I'm always open to that, and, uh, basically, I was just gonna ramble on a little bit about nanofish, keeping shrimp and nanofish together, keeping bigger fish and shrimp together, I've had quite a bit of experience with this, uh, I must state that everybody's case will be different, and I can't say that what works for me will work for you, but on that note, let's turn this around, uh, I'm gonna show you this looks a little dirty right now and that's uh, actually because I just took a cucumber out of there that everyone was chowing on so uh, I have owned a green phantom pleco and green and blue phantom plecos seem very similar uh, they hide a lot um, if you want to see them I would recommend putting a log or something in the center that they can hide under like an arch like driftwood or something or manzanita but don't build them too many caves and if you have a cave uh, angle it at an angle like this so that you can see in what they're up to rather than uh, rather than not so on the note of the Moscow guppy in chat here is my blue Hawaiian Moscow guppy from Bentley uh, look all metallic -y and pretty uh loose uh or louis uh segura hello bob kaler my man how's it going so as i said the particles floating around in here are cucumber uh i just pulled out my skewers of cucumber that had been in there two days but i have now found what my loaches my panda loaches what they love to eat and apparently that is cucumber they don't like the rind they will just eat the the mushy part after it's sat a little while but they will sit on that cucumber for no joke day and night until they pass out in a food coma and you can see their teeny little bellies how full they are that midline on them their bellies are just as full as can be. That one actually just ate a piece of cucumber that was just floating in the water. So, kind of cute. Okay, let's see. But I agree with Alex. Yeah, uh, they hide a lot. Um, yeah, so a note about plecos. And on that note, I kind of... Uh, there's a very few fish that are larger than nanofish that I fudge the rules for and say there's that's what's left of the cucumber and it's also grown algae too which uh it looks unsightly but I have a lot of fish in here that will actually nibble on that so I'll let that be for a little bit and then yeah but basically they uh plecos I consider as compatible in a nano fish environment not in a nano tank mind you this is my quote-unquote nano tank. The guppy is the largest critter in the tank. These two guppies are. And that's it, like as far as size goes. The next closest things are the CPDs. Right now I can't play with the contrast or anything, but they're actually a pretty royal color. Um, <clears throat> the Blue Dream shrimp in this tank are everywhere. And also, let's see if we can find some... But the Malawa shrimp, see all this algae? This is a new thing, and uh, I used a new, uh, or not a new, but I went back from using the ADA uh, this visor, 
uh, 88 uh, green brighty mineral, which has everything that uh, the aquarium co-ops uh, easy green seems to have, but uh, it basically has extra micro fertilizers and some of those trace metals and things that, that other ones don't have, but essentially it has no nitrogen in it and no iron in it. Well, it has a teeny bit of iron in it, but it has no iron in it really. And this tank produces such a low bio load, even though there are over, I want to say about 35 fish in this 17 gallon tank. Um, they're all super teeny fish and they're skinny and produce very, they don't eat meat a ton. So, you know, they're not like, uh, one, a pleco eats a ton of algae and vegetation and leaves a bunch of mess in the form of mulm. Whereas nano fish, um, unless you have something like a scarlet baddis or, um, you know, there's, there's a range of small fish that eat only like their little hunters and they have definitely more messy, more ammonia and nitrate rich, uh, fecal matter. And that makes it so that the bio load's different. Whereas if you have like chili rasporus or, um, you know, something like that, uh, these little blue axelrod, uh, rasboras or, uh, celestial pearls or these little guys the panda uh, loaches they all have a super low footprint so when you're thinking about a nano tank you can cram a nano tank like not a five gallon you don't want to cram a five gallon full of fish but you can cram a nano tank full of a lot of fish even like a 10 gallon that you might not expect being able to do just you know do it slowly and test your nitrates along the way but as long as you have a lot of plants packed in there also they'll handle it just fine and with the size of these fish they're small enough that i like to give my fish about 30 lengths of their body to swim around the tank in one direction like diagonal or whatever but i like to make sure they have that so if my fish are about an inch i want to make sure that they have close to 30 inches that way um Ideally, now in nano tanks where you only have a five gallon, I I I don't listen to that rule, but I only put like five to ten fish in it usually. Uh, also, thought I'd show you this is the shrimp that I pulled out of the big tank that looked like a freak with the stripe. Hold on, guys, let's see if we can get it to show without blinding you all. So. Now it looks like this. It's clearly a blue shrimp, which is interesting, but it has this uh, gold or tan patch on its back. It does have orange eyes, so that hasn't changed, but it was pregnant. It was a female. It may still be pregnant. I can't tell from this angle, and I know that's terrible quality video, but it's super zoomed in. You can see those orange eyes with the black pupil. Um... So, interesting one. It's the only one, and since it's not a male, I threw it in this tank of blues. Because basically, I'll see its babies, and if they look like way out there, then I'll be able to uh, yank as many of those as I can and not change the whole gene pool to some weird, wild type of blues. <clears throat> but you can see even she has mostly a blue color to her uh, when I show her from far away that's her in, under that leaf back there but this tank uh i switched over back to easy green and all of a sudden i have all this algae and it's algae um growing all over the delicate stuff and so there's a couple ways i could fix this which is on today's topic also which is these shrimp and they do an okay job i mean they they walk through and they eat stuff but did you know that algae can double its mass every six hours, like a strand of hair algae? So it's really no competition for... Uh, by the way, these loaches hang out in groups of two. Uh, there's two up there, two here, two over there, and two over here. And uh, algae can grow 
just like crazy um, in the right conditions. And uh, I'll get the balance back. It's just going to require some water changes, some pulling, and no more ferts. Believe it or not, what I like to do is I will uh, take the CO2 and crank it up. I will crank up the CO2. And yes, that does make the algae grow, but it makes the plants grow. And whatever there's too much of in the water, which is probably phosphorus or nitrogen, if it's if if uh, al algae is growing, um, however you like to say it, then this stuff, which is kind of a pain, I'll wait for it to grow pretty thick. Like, see how thick it is here. You can actually reach in, and if you were to pinch right there in, and twist, it'll come up in a big clump, and then that's a lot easier to deal with. Same with on these plants. I'm not going to mess with that amount right now uh, because I'll wait till it's all kind of connected, and then we'll we'll go in and we'll, like I'm going to do here right now just to show you, like this is on the Bucifal under, but we can kind of, pick at the algae, algae and uh, get some there. Some will float away and get attached to something else. But where else did we see it? Down in here, maybe? Down in here. Uh, but this allows us, you see how much you can get in, in a, a single pinch. But you got to be careful not to dislodge your plants either. But this will allow you and this limnophilia just totally gets covered in algae but the key is you roll your your hands in the algae like this so that it kind of balls up and then even if it floats off you can kind of catch it again so that's i mean that's a good fair bit of al algae coming off right there and uh pretty easy even though it is manual work but you can see it looks a lot cleaner in here where it just came from so and that all ends up here i'm just gonna wipe it off on this rock for a second just because i'm sitting here i'll wash that rock later but yeah so basically co2 takes whatever potential growing power your plants have and it allows i mean what are plants made out of physically carbon like they're a carbon-based life form so most of their mass is water first of all which is in the tank but the rest is carbon of the if you were to dry it out it would be carbon and that's because the links in all the molecules carbon has eight i believe is it eight yeah to link up with in in lots of combinations and it is just waiting to link up with other uh atomic uh chart elements so that's why we are carbon based silicone is the next closest thing or silicates uh and then phosphorus comes in somewhere ranking somewhere in there uh and wouldn't you know it those are some of the the biggest things that we use in the hobby to grow plants and then the other big one, limnophilia, came unplanted. The other big one that we use is sunlight, obviously, or, you know, artificial light. And the way that creates energy is it builds ATP. If you don't know what ATP is, check out my last video about everything being connected and lightning. And it's it's kind of an all-over-the-board video, but it is... It really explains a lot of things about uh, how plants grow on a fundamental all plants and uh, big generalizations about ATP, your fish, your plants, every single thing, your bacteria, your algae uses ATP. And uh, you know what? Let's go downstairs real quick because while we're talking about nanotanks, you're really balancing elements and the thing you're you're balancing it's real easy to screw up a dose on a nano tank if i lose you here pardon me we'll restart the chat if i have to 
It's not the weekend, so hopefully I won't lose you guys too badly. Um, but here is my larger tank, which had algae all over the place. And now the only place there's some algae is on the glass. But if you look back into the tank, there is almost no algae to be found anywhere. So uh, that's that's cool. And the way I did that was I pumped the CO2 like crazy, did some water changes. And also I have my helpers. So I have a uh, little... Uh, red, super red plecos. I have uh, pandagaras, and then I have uh, just you know other fish like gouramis and things that will nibble on it in a small amount, along with shrimp in here. So I'm gonna have you guys look at this real quick. So this is ATP, um, and this molecule is what we all run on. Every cell in your body needs this to run. It's made in the mitochondria. And if you look carefully, you've got hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and then carbon. You see the carbon there? And then nitrogen. And this is phosphates. This is a phosphate chain. You see how this pattern repeats? It allows it to hook on as different salts. So we've basically got salts, a sugar, and the basis for uh, DNA, adenine, guanine. Uh, so that's the ATCG of DNA. And this stuff is traded in your ecosystem. So the plants can get it from the light and they make it in their mitochondria of their cells. And they can get that from the light, which they have. They use um, they use their uh, chlorophyll to to uh, turn that into uh, with their chromat is it uh, not chromatophores, but their um, chromatocytes. Maybe I can't remember the word. I'm sorry, you guys. But they they use their the the green in plants is actively working to catch certain wavelengths the best wavelengths basically of light to turn that light into that is potential energy they trap that and they build atp with it but where do they get the raw material to create atp that's why we add phosphates that's why we add carbon in the form of either co2 root tabs or actual like carbon in your filters that's why we add uh, nitrites and nitrates and it's all kind of linked back to ATP which is like the magical chemical for all of us and all life on earth and whether you have your big tank or your nano tank it's going to use it and it's going to build from it uh, and yes so the CO2 in your tank provides carbon and oxygen and your plants believe it or not, need to breathe oxygen. Each cell needs to respire, which is basically letting old air out and new air in. It takes the oxygen molecule off that, saves it for the ATP, for the CO2, or for air. In the daytime, what your plants are doing is they're taking in from light, they're just taking in light and CO2. And they're building those chemicals with whatever's in the water and soil so now the roots are working the hardest to make to get the carbon and the phosphates because that's usually found in the ground right but in aquatic plants there are exceptions a lot of them do get their nutrients from the water and that has a name if you get your water uh from, or you get your nutrients from the water or the or the substrate, and I'm forgetting the, the term for plants, but I can do a video on that later. Um, it's just terminology that I'm like having a, a brain freeze on. But they take that, and in the daytime, they make oxygen. So all that's coming out is the oxygen, and they're keeping the carbon, and then they're using whatever from the ground to build... ATP 
and to take the excess carbon f that they breathe in in the form of CO2 that animals make, and they actually use that CO2 uh, because carbon is so easily bonded with. So let's draw a little picture. Picture time! So, sorry guys. So carbon has, I think it's eight. Is it eight? Can anybody confirm on the whatever table? But it makes these rings. It has a free space for three, uh, three things the way it's charged, for three other atoms. And so it can link up... Um, and it depends on uh, how it's charged, uh, how many electrons it has, if it if it's a uh, if it's negative or positively charged. But carbon gets changed in its form as ions and things and anions. But basically, yeah, they're water molecular feeders. But I can't remember the name for that. Um, but this can link up then with whatever you know, uh, iron, and then the iron. You know, so it basically allows you the carbon allows a lot of places to link up. You'll see um, like patterns like this a lot, where these points are carbon, and then off of here you'll have some other chemical, and those are kind of the building blocks for stuff. Six, sorry, six. Thank you, Jeff. Oxygen has eight, right? I was like, I can't remember which is which. So, it, whatever. So, it has six spots to bond, uh, in theory, potentially, even though uh, I believe two to four are generally taken up. But, we're not getting into chemistry, like, super heavy. That I haven't thought about that in years. But I'm just trying to let you know... Um, <laughs> thanks for Googling it, Jeff. Uh, I'm trying to let you know that, basically, that carbon is like gold to both plants and animals because that is the building block of most of the cellular, molecular, and chemical structures. So that's why CO2, it doesn't build the plant. It doesn't grow the plant and make it red. What it does is it allows little, like, it, think of it as a dock. It is like, hey, Blake, it, like, carbon is like a dock or, or a parking lot that's empty. And the plant has it inside, and it's just waiting to get nitrogen or potassium or phosphorus or some chain of, you know, potassium uh, permanganate or some, you know, some crazy molecule it's waiting for that it needs to turn red, for instance, like iron or something. Uh, and so that empty parking lot that is carbon that it has created. Uh, that is stripped down, taken the oxygen off of, and breathed it out what it doesn't need in the daytime. At nighttime, your plants go to bed, and they're no longer do photosynthesis deal, and they are now building. So your plants actually, I mean, they grow in the day carbon-wise, but they... Uh, they grow in a diverse way, like patch their holes in their system and their and uh, and things that are melting and stuff like that, and colors. And they close up in the day or at night, and that is how they um, basically uh, build themselves and get more and more complex. That's like a very dumbed down version of it. Uh, Otter Creek Aquatics, what's up? HC Aquatics, what's up? Uh, can I know how many days HC Cuba foreground plants can still underwater? Can still underwater without CO2? They can. Li it can live underwater indefinitely without CO2. I mean, get a substrate that has high amounts of carbon in it, like some charcoal or something in it. Um, or just wood that has carbon in it, for instance, like some mulch or bogwood uh, substrate, and it would do better than in like an inert substrate like clay or something. Uh, but it will also basically the uh, the substrate will allow a certain amount of growth from uh, baby tears, as he's referencing uh, uh, Cuban mini. Uh, 
And it's just a hard one to carpet. I actually have some carpeting in here. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's a, it either it's either feast or famine for it. And for me, I've always had a rough time with a bunch of other plants in the tank getting a good solid carpet of it. Uh, but I have had it carpet. It's just going to... I, I think it relies more on light. So plants, when they need light, and this is all this applies to nano or to big tanks, but in a nano tank, you have a lot less room for error. And so I'm telling you all this stuff because there's things you can do in inputs and outputs by taking things out or putting things in that make a huge difference. And I want you to know why you're putting phosphorus in the water. Why you're using CO2. If you need CO2. If you have an anubi anubius, you probably don't need CO2. Uh, ADA soil, yeah, so that's what I'm doing too. Um, and I would use a strong light. I think that's your best bet, honestly. CO2 is great and helpful in helping it grow because that gives it carbon and, and it's also getting carbon from the substrate, the uh, ADA amazonia and it's getting other minerals from the substrate and basically oh hey fancy tail aquatics welcome so basically you can take that substrate and it will supply enough with with ada substrate it has enough oomph on its own to keep the uh baby tears growing but as you see here, it gets kind of sporadic, and if another plant can steal that free roaming, whatever it is, the carbon dioxide or the oxygen, any of those building blocks we talked about, it will. so that's why you really want to establish your carpet before other things if you can help it. Otherwise, it can be a slog. Also, doing a dry start is really the best way to go with getting like a, you know, like you see in pictures online, like incredible uh, carpets. It's either that or they're using uh, Monte Carlo is all, an easier version of the same kind of, uh, it has the same kind of effect. Now, the problem with that is if you don't have a strong enough light and a lot of nano tanks people don't put a good enough light on it. They put like a reading lamp that comes with the tank or something. And basically plants want as much light as possible. And so when you're looking at the, the plants, they're tuned to specific wavelengths of light. So why is a plant red? Well, there could be an evolutionarily, uh, there could be an evolutionary reason like it wants to attract uh, bees or fish to pollinate it to check it out see it that see that spectrum but more than likely with plants it's the same as like trees that's leaves turn color later in the year is that chlorophyll changes and has different amounts depending on how much sunlight is needed and it turns more and more red as it has the sunlight it needs and it grows less fast up to the top and it gets more dense and squat. So instead of having these runners like, like this plant's kind of leggy because it's far over and not under the light. Whereas the same exact plant is right over here, if you can see it, and it's squat and it's only maybe half an inch apart from each leaf section but that's because the light bar shines right over it now co coincidentally i picked that plant because it's also growing out of the tank and it has grown right over into the light so much so that it has burned itself but i just wanted to let a few plants grow immersed just so i could show you guys what they look like and submerged it actually, look how far and few between the leaves are. Can you guys see this gap here from this leaf to that leaf? It's because those leaves aren't doing it much good. They're not gathering a lot of sunlight. And see how it's yellow, this leaf? I don't know if you can make that out, but it's a yellow color. And that's because it doesn't need, it's not using the, it's chromatophores or it's, uh, it's not using its, its, uh, ability to turn light into energy because this can and there's enough co2 in the in 
the air that we breathe. Now remember, air and oxygen are not the same thing. Air is 70% nitrogen, 20-some percent oxygen, and the rest is like carbon and CO2, locked up types of oxygen, uh, carbon dioxide, car carbon monoxide, things like that. Um, and so these plants, they don't need the CO2 in the water because there's way more CO2 in the air. Plus, in the water, you see there's like foggy things, and there's stuff in the way, and water itself reflects light, right? You see it reflecting light. Well, it also does that to light incoming. And so the farther you go down in water, the less light works. And so you'll get leggy plants that don't have a thick, uh, they don't have very, like their leaves are sparsely intertwined because they're just going to reach, they're going to make a run for the light, which is high up. And with carpeting plants, like you were talking about the mini, uh, mini baby tears, uh, here's another example. See how there's not even another leaf nodule anywhere on that plant until it's up where it can get light. So this is basically, I mean, this. these are all examples of, and like these ones that I trimmed, used to have leaves up top, but now all the leaves, there's not even a single leaf. So it's like, hurry up and grow. We're just getting nutrients from the roots. And you can see there's no leaves on, on any of these plants down low like that. So when you try to carpet, it can get leggy. So where you see that, see that it's growing upward in that top left corner. Over here where there's some, it's straight up an inch tall because it's been outcompeted for light. So that wasn't a good place to plant it. I just had some extra and I put it there. But in a nano tank, you got to be really aware of that, like what plant is going to overshadow another plant and how intense to have your light. Because you fish, you don't want to like drive them nuts either, right? Um, but some fish like light, like pandagars. Now that's not really a nano fish. Um, but this tank... Other than the Siamese algae eaters, the pandagaras, and the uh, the garamis, everything and the plecos, everything else is pretty much nano. And I wanted to show you guys. Usually they're around somewhere in here. Let's see if we can find one. But usually there's a shrimp hanging out somewhere, just chilling. And I just wanted to let you guys know that you can have shrimp in a tank with gouramis that tear shrimp apart normally and the key is to having these like rock piles and hiding spots for your shrimp if they can hide somewhere they'll be okay um and in a nano tank uh you want to decide on what kind of shrimp you want most people are going to want a shrimp with color that's interesting and I would say if you are trying to go for a, um, if you want like a, a caradina, uh, like that would include crystal, black crystal, red crystal, um, blue, uh, bolts, things like that. I would highly suggest that you not put a bunch of fish in your nano tank. I would say that the specifications for those shrimp and also the CO2 and stuff for that that tank is going to have to be you're going to have to be careful because when you put CO2 into the water it actually lowers the pH and so when it's turned off at night it skyrockets the pH and also the oxygen level in the tank dips because plants are now respiring CO2 and not oxygen. They've done what they can with the sunlight and the ATP and the carbon as building blocks. And now they're basically just getting rid of the excess gases and things that were built up in, in, the, cell, in the cells. So... Um, Another type of tank that we have that's shrimp only, if we're going to talk about that, is like my tank down here. These two tanks. This one looks so depressing, doesn't it, guys? Well, it's not about the plants. It's about 
the shrimp. And so we have some shadow pandas, we have uh, snails, and just like lame stuff in my opinion. Uh, but the shrimp breeding there. We've got, you can see a uh, red tiger that's kind of interesting over there. Um, and then over here in this tank, this is my blue dream hatchery. Lucas Brett's LRB Aquapum. Shout out to him for, uh, I bought these off of him and then he supplied me some free ones for designing the art on his shirts and on his posters and for his company. Uh, also in here are Babalti shrimp. Now, when you have other shrimp that are not as mainstream, I think it's smart, unless you know a lot about how they interact, to not keep them together with fish. Now, these guys, these Babaltis, I have kept them with fish, and fish will eat their babies immediately. So right now you can see there's lots of babies that are out in the open. In a fish tank, these will all get eaten immediately. Um, and ironically, some people think that in your nano tank, that basically, uh, oh, those, those shrimp, you know, they're small and my fish are small, so it won't be a problem. Like my, my CPD isn't going to bug these Neo, uh, Caradina Endler or Neo Caradina, Caradina, cherry shrimp or blue dreams or uh golden backs whatever sakura reds sakura um yellow whatever you're thinking about shrimp wise um so a lot of people think well i'll put small fish in there and it won't be a problem now that is true for the adults but i can keep garamis and Siamese algae eaters and even angelfish with some adult shrimp. Now, cribs, bad idea. Cichlids, bad idea in general. Um, any predatorial fish that is an omnivore or eats meat or crustacean, you know, just avoid that if it's over three inches. But I do have to say that I have a thriving colony. They have babies in this tank. The babies just don't always survive, and that's because of the tiny fish, not the big fish. The big fish don't waste their time hunting down little teeny, like, half a millimeter long shrimp. Now, they may eat the medium-sized ones, but by that point, they, the shrimp are usually wily and quick enough that they just flick away and hide under something. So, ironically, let's go back upstairs. Um, those... Like, those shrimp do better off with medium-sized fish, like these ones. Because, like, guppies, like an inch or two long, rather than half an inch or whatever. Because the half an inch fish, especially, like, the scarlet baddis, is one that, in particular, like, hunts down baby shrimp. Like, that's what they were born to do, is they're micro-predators, they eat tiny little crustaceans. It's like their job in life. So in this tank over here, we have mostly tiny eating, like most of these fish eat tiny little creatures. And so the hope that these blue dreams uh, reproduce in this tank, they're going to reproduce. And there's probably 40 or 50 blue dreams in this tank. But... Probably 90% of their babies will get eaten. Now, that being said, if you're okay with that, or if you take the pregnant mothers out and put them in a tank like I have downstairs, then you can actually manage to grow your shrimp population. So that's why I recommend if you have a nano tank or a medium-sized tank of fish, um, size-wise fish, not just the tank, have a five gallon or 10 gallon, the beer is better uh, with shrimp colonies just because the water parameters stay the same. You're less likely to screw things up uh, by adding too much cold water or hot water, or, you know, whatever it may be. But in here, this, these shrimp, which at first I'm like, where'd they all go? But then I see one here, I see another one right back in there, I see one up here. Um, there's another one 
back in there, over there. Uh, and there's just these blue shrimp all over the place in this tank when you start. Like, oh, Blake! Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Blake's Aquatics, for the $2 super chat. Every dollar counts and helps me out a lot. Um, you know, I've had, obviously, I know I've said it a million times, but in case you haven't heard it, a lot of medical bills going on since the lightning strike. By the way, here is a Malawa shrimp, and these are the ultimate algae eater in the Neo or in the Caradina world. Um, they eat as good as dare I say, as good as a mono shrimp. And they're not the prettiest. They come in different color variants of clear, and they won't interbreed with your neocaridina, and they're fairly peaceful. Now, peaceful for shrimp, they still are going to fight over pellets, but the fighting isn't like they kill each other usually. It's like they're hopping around, and you're like, what are you doing? Um... Now, the other great thing for algae in this tank, which I use my nano tanks for, is really teeny young, um, really teeny young uh, plecos. So I will take these plecos that are a quarter inch or half an inch long and put them in this tank because nothing's going to eat them. Over here, you can see my leopard frog pleco, and it's chewing away on algae in there, even though they eat more meat. And so, whereas this tank is not at all going to be where they stay, I play musical fish and just keep track of my fish because you're, gonna, you're not going to miss like a four-inch fish hiding in a tank this size if you, if you uh, give proper attention and affection to your tanks. Um, the other thing that I was going to talk about with the nano tanks and the shrimp is that if you think you're going to take care of your algae with just shrimp, you are incorrect. The shrimp will not do that. Um, they will help clean in between. So say you have a tank that's at the stage that mine is at downstairs. That tank is a great place for shrimp to clean things. They will clean the dwarf baby tears, the limnophilia, the pogo stem and erectus, things like that. They can get in there and clean the uh, the boosts, all those sort of things. They they clean. See right now, he's cleaning in between really tiny, little delicate areas, and that's great for those bigger tanks. Ironically, uh, that have the spots with less algae. It's just when you get algae like this that's out of control, this will have to be hand removed. Like there's just, it's gonna suck. I'm just gonna have to pull that out and then make sure that the phosphates and everything are adjusted correctly. For me, I'm there's hardly any phosphorus in Easy Green, which is a downside and why I started using the ADA. But these guys were, we're producing like zero nitrites so or nitrates so when i tested the tank i've had all these fish in here and nitrates were at zero and i was like you know my nitrates at like 20 or 30 for uh the plants for especially for some of these plants like limnophilia aromatica really needs that um the uh, vietnamese um rotala and you know, some of the super red Ludwigia, hydrocotyl, uh, verticulata, things like that. It needs a little bit um, in there with these delicate plants. Uh, with the Rotala Wallichii, Wallichia, whatever you want to call it. Um, and you're not getting their proper colors right now because this camera on my phone is not the best. But I was going to say what I'm, I'm hoping to do with Super Chat Money soon is start... Uh, two funds, and that is a fund to, I mean, we already made the accomplishment through Patreon of getting CO2 for the tanks. I only had one CO2 thing, now I've got a 20 pound CO2 deal and uh, three regulators in, in total. And so that allows me to introduce you guys to a whole lot of different things. Rod S, welcome. And you say, make your own dry furts, control in this experiment at different concentrations. Yeah. That is totally true. Um, that is the ultimate level of control. And I have thought about going in with a couple people. Actually, I have a friend uh, online who sells um, 
Ferts that he mixes into liquids. And I mean, what a bottle for 10 bucks or 12 bucks sells for, uh, it's like less than 50 cents or 10 cents in some cases of actual ingredients. So even though Easy Green is a total ripoff, uh, if you were to go buy bags, like who wants to go buy a 50 pound bag of phosphorus or whatever it may be? Um, that's not always the case. There are some some things you can buy in smaller amounts and do yourself. This blue Moscow Hawaiian that I got from Bentley Pasco is just really uh, the light when it catches the light from outside on the window. You get that beautiful tail movement. And I've filmed a lot of these uh, fish lately in uh, super slow-mo on the phone. It allows me to do a thousand frames per second, which is pretty cool. And you can see that ripple moving and the, like see how its muscles contract and release. Now, if does anybody have questions about mini tanks? I'm kind of just rambling in this in this live stream, and I'm kind of just talking about a lot of different things and aspects of keeping shrimp in your nano tanks. Now, really, if you want to raise numbers of shrimp, you you really need to uh, the lights on that tank. Uh, I have an Archeon uh, 30 watt, and I have a Aqua Sky or Aquio Sky uh, 18 watt on there. Now this is 230 watt um, Go Sun or Can Sun. Wait, no, Go Sun, G O S U N, with Cree LEDs. These are floodlights that are supposed to be mounted outside for other uses, but they've worked really well growing plants and as your as your um as your tank goes through different stages you'll see that like this rock has algae on it but it just it's just gonna sit there like this level of algae it's just gonna be this way forever you know like it's at a it's a fine seasoning and same with this wood like it'll continue to to uh, decompose but it's got this almost patina on it it's like this red burgundy colored uh growth of algae on it and it's just gonna stay that way now i wanted to show you down here too that i have some puffer fish that are hunting baby endlers see it down there it's waiting to to make a move so pea puffers even though i have them in a community tank um ooh, and it just went down did it get it no didn't I think it spends most of its time in vain trying to get them. But pea puffers, not a community fish. Don't try that. You know, I put them in here and I thought at first they were in a pen and I was kind of watching their behavior. Then I let them out, put a couple in, and they were a little aggressive and I was like, oh, this isn't going to work. But then I put six in at once. By the way, there's a baby green dragon that's three inches long and some of its uh, related brothers and sisters are still under an inch long. So it, it's bizarre to me, the growth patterns of plecos. Can't figure it out. They're in the same tank. They get fed the same stuff. I guess some are just runts and some are just giants. So, um, yeah, so I just wanted to discuss that. Also, in this tank... Got kind of, are there shrimp in this tank? Yes, so there are some shrimp in this tank. That's where the crazy shrimp with the stripe down its back, that tannish beige pink stripe down its back and the orange eyes and the blue body. That's where that came from was this tank. And it had been hiding out. Now there used to be beautiful red uh, painted line, like top of the line, don't get any better as red cherry neocaridina shrimp in this tank. There were like a hundred of them. What happened was uh, I had a peacock gudgeon, which you wouldn't think would be like the biggest killer in the world, but it was, and it killed a good amount of even the adults. Didn't eat them, just killed them. But So I got rid of the gudgeon, still had like 70 probably shrimp, chilling out around 
And then what do I do that is uh, stupid on my part? Well, I put cribs, African cribs in this tank. And I have Crebenzis bapindi and a Crebenzis pulcher male. Once again, supposedly don't mix your cribs. At least don't mix them. This is a baby crib right here. Um, don't mix them and let them out into the supply of in the market. If you're going to do stuff at home, erythromicron and, and um, celestial pearl daniels, feel free to mix. Feel free to mix whatever you want um, as long as the fish are happy and aren't, like, deformed. Uh, I'm all for mixing. Uh, oh, here's the, the crib hiding down there. You can see the beautiful color runoff. But um, that and the Siamese algae eater, which you'd think is kind of peaceful maybe because it's of its name, it's not. It'll eat shrimp. It'll bug shrimp. It'll just, like, take them and pull them off of stuff. Just jerk. Like, rip them off us. The, the, rip them off the uh, stick they're sitting on or whatever. But I wanted to show you, too, a new plant that I got. Um, got this new melon flame sword. And it has this cool... Uh, runner that's going upward and I could have cut it and had two of these plants but I'm just going to see what it wants to do because it's kind of cool that down here we've got this really pretty uh, plant with this like cool texture that goes this one way and then on the other side it goes a different way and it's got some red leaves and some green leaves and then all the way up here uh, the the runner I cut all the little white runner roots off of it and uh yeah so it's it's kind of cool little plant it's going to need a little bit of iron not a ton because in the amazon there is not a ton of iron anyhow um you don't need to worry it's good to know where your plants are from in the world because that informs a lot if you guys haven't seen the last video where i talk about atp and how the dust storms and sandstorms in the Bodell Depression, which is in the Sahara Desert of Africa, that is what creates every hurricane that hits the United States. It is what brings almost all the phosphorus to the Amazon rainforest. It brings a ton of carbon, and it also creates, through lightning storms, the only place on Earth where nitrates are found is either made in the body of organisms but they need those essential in essential ingredients first uh or in lightning so lightning or the sun a star where fission and fusion type explosions out in space supernovas collapses things like that that's where um nitrogen and nitrate and things like that are formed but the 50,000 degree temperature of a bolt of lightning actually cracks the air, rips apart the uh, molecules in the air, breaks them down to their constituent parts, and, and leaves them as singular elements for a moment, only to reform as whatever is the most likely formation given the now knocked off electrons. Because electrons are floating around your core nucleus, in an element and if there's two free spots it's going to bond with another thing that has two free electrons um or maybe it loans one that's a whole other level of science i don't want to make you guys get into that but basically uh nitrates that plants need phosphorus and carbon which is created through forest fires by burning, you get both activated and non-activated carbon. Um, and activated carbon is just carbon that's ready to grab hold of stuff. It has basically like those little arms I drew, the six spots that carbon has. It has room to bond with something and either envelop it so it's not a problem or bond with it and make a more complex molecule. So... All that stuff goes on in your little tanks as well. And that's why when you put a little bit of phosphorus in, it can throw everything off, including things like carbon, because 
that may mean that, you know, or you crank up the CO2, well, then it decides that it doesn't need carbon environment because it's getting the CO2 carbon in abundance. And then what happens when you turn down the CO2 or you introduce a fertilizer that has a good amount of carbon in it? Well, you're left with excess carbon that's just floating in the water and there to uh, just be in the water. And it oftentimes then can bond with other chemicals, including things like nitrogen and other stuff that then uh, in compounds... And then it locks it up so it's not even useful. So you need to be aware of that stuff. And usually you can just follow the bottle, um, to be honest. But I wanted to tell you guys, teach you guys, so to speak, uh, the very, very basics. And, you know, I'm probably bending the truth a little bit um, because basically... Um, it makes it easier. Like, there's exceptions to everything I'm saying. And I might, if I say this uh, atomic element has six free, uh, you know, spots for things to latch on, it's not that simple. And it's also maybe there's not six in this form. There are in others. There's an ion of it or an anion of it, whatever. So for you who do know all that science, uh, ignore, you can ignore that, um, and just forgive me. But for you who don't, that's hopefully an easier way to explain why some of these things have the impact that they do. Um, also, if you haven't hit that like button yet, I would really appreciate that. That would be, uh, fan friggin tastic. Uh, appreciate it. I see, uh, someone just did it as I mentioned it. And, uh, the other thing is that I want to know what you guys want to hear about. I'd love to have more of a dialogue and help you guys with any problems you have in your tanks and stuff. Uh, also, I just saw in the chat that somebody mentioned uh, having a tank with activated carbon as the substrate. Now, what that would do is take out any toxins but good stuff too in the water and then it wouldn't be activated carbon anymore it would be bonded filled up innate carbon that only certain processes can break down that being said it may be an interesting experiment to do on a small scale i don't know try it out and to answer the other questions yes there were shrimp in this tank and yes there are still some but the cribs hunt them so bad that I only see them at night now. And they do not reproduce in any level that's increasing. They are on the decrease. And I would rescue them, but it's too hard to catch them. They are such fast shrimp now after being hunted that, yeah. So does anybody have any other questions before I sign off here? Um, how cool of temperature would you need? Would you feel comfortable keeping Neos in on the low end? That is a really interesting question, Maple Street Aquatics. Um, you know, I have actually had ponds outside, and I've had um, them live in the low 40s. I've actually had a pond ice over, and the shrimp go into hibernation, and just like a goldfish or something would, or a trout, and underneath the ice, the water stays at like 38 to 44 degrees or something along those lines. It actually insulates the coldness. So once you get a layer of ice, it's actually less cold than if it's like 35 degrees out. That's going to be the coldest point for your, your, your critters. All that being said, I had some cherry shrimp survive freezes. And I've realized this like a week after the fact um, a lot of them won't make it, but if it's, if it's been ongoing, they can get used to that because, uh, you know, they're a very, they live in the mountains, streams, limestone streams of Taiwan and China and, uh, South Asia, but there are spots where it actually can get pretty darn cold. And, you know, there are some, Neocaridinas that are found in rivers that are 60 degrees anyways. It's just we like them to have a nice bright color from their metabolism being all up to speed and everything. They turn kind of a faded color and they basically don't move much. They don't eat much. And uh, 
so forth under about 67 degrees but they're just fine uh or 65 i'd say but really like the ultimate goal if you were just caring about neocaridina shrimp i would keep them 67 to 74 somewhere in there when you keep it hotter i keep it hotter honestly because they have babies more frequently and i like the numbers of them to make an impact in my aesthetics in my tank by the way sorry i didn't clean my tanks before this live stream what up matthew more cichlids how's it going lorena you're so late <laughs> but hello yeah i agree um so maple streak aquatics also says i only ask because i'm trying to run my fish room without tank heaters and the temps are already in the high 60s yeah so if your fish can handle it and they're tropical fish and they handle it just fine your neocaridinas will too it's just they don't want to be thrown into that all of a sudden so like do it over the course of a week bring it down like a degree a day or two degrees a day maybe from the 76 or whatever it's at and uh you can easily have shrimp at 67 degrees now caridina shrimp things like that they actually like those cooler temperatures frequently and will be fine, but they really hate going too cold or too hot. Too hot is the easiest way to kill your shrimp. Uh, on the low end, you have a better chance of them surviving. So, again, if you're here, please hit that like button. I appreciate it a lot, a lot, a lot. And if you have questions, let me know right now because I'm probably going to get off the internets and uh maybe work on a video for you guys i want to work on a video about submerged versus immersed growth and like show you guys what rotala looks like in a co2 tank versus a low-tech tank that gets natural light and does i haven't even been turning on the light because there's enough growth with what comes in the afternoon light lies here versus high light high uh nutrients but no CO2, no FERTs right now, last few months, um, versus the tank that's like, it's got CO2, it's got FERTs, it's got food with all of the vitamins and minerals, it's, you know, whatever. Uh, so this is the, the tank that's a fancy pantsy tank, and I'd like to show you guys what these plants look like also maybe get some plants blooming that's another project even though it's winter i know that's insane but on the on the mention of heating a room instead of heating a tank as soon as you have like four or five tanks that's probably going to be more efficient because uh it is very hard to heat up water with a conductor uh, conductive heat now inductive heat uh without zapping your fish um uh hit the like button catch the rest on replay good idea john gonzalez yeah you can always replay these episodes and everything um the other thing is uh you guys see how like distorted this color is um Versus like how you guys can probably see that that is a burgundy red with a peach in the center. And now it looks like a, I don't know, pinkish, yellow-ish. So I want to get a better camera. I want to get a better mic set up. And that's expensive, as I'm sure you guys know. But that will be what I'm taking Super Chat and Patreon money for somewhat. And then also so will... Uh, the aquatic experience next year, I want to be able to go to that. I had so many people asking if I was going this year, including, um, you know, like Lucas Bretz and stuff like that. Like, just people were like, are you going to be at the YouTube booth? And um, John, uh, um, oh man, from uh, JH Aquatics, I'm totally spacing on his last name. But in any case, just people that I'm, you know, acquainted through, plus lots of uh, people who watch the channel. Shrimp Granny Jess, who's always in our chats. She's there. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have a me method when transitioning a plant brought from a local fish store to submerged? You know, I don't have a good method per se 
other than just throwing it in and giving it a good amount of light. And then also, whenever I see it melting, I totally get rid of that. Now, swords and crypts seem to be the worst for me, as well as little grasses. So these little grasses melt on you sometimes, and it'll turn black in the grasses or gray. I'm trying to see if that's going on anywhere. Now, this isn't a, a grass. This is... Uh, this is um, Vietnamese, uh, wait, hold on, uh, do you immediately, uh, you know, so that's a good point, so Joel, or, uh, Corvus o Oskin, o o Oskin, I don't know, I, I never know how to say the second part, where all of us in the Northwest are, like, always ribbing him about, like, how do you say the second part of your, cha your, 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 uh, steampunk name, or whatever it is on your channel, um, but yes, you can float it, and that allows it to be right next to the light, which is more uh, realistically how it was growing outside. Also, that allows part of the plant, in theory, like this, to be outside of the water. And so this plant, be having just its crown outside of the water, will absorb more CO2 than probably the rest of the base of it. I, I don't have proof of that for this species, but... The amount of of uh, CO2 and nitrogen from the atmosphere uh, that a plant can absorb just in open uh, air versus in water is crazy. So the fact that there are aquatic plants is really an amazing thing in evolution. So as I said, it's a little bit... Um, scatterbrained but if you want to know what we talked about earlier in this stream and you're just tuning in you can watch this stream but i would recommend that you watch my video that has the big thunderhead looking dust cloud over the amazon that i posted a couple days ago in that i go into uh molecular chemistry in a hopefully simple way and basically you'll see why we use the elements we do in the aquarium hobby and so i'm going to continue to kind of try to make this more simple i realized i didn't make it the most simple it could be but it once you understand these things then you can play with them and that's really the power in like especially with a uh cube you really want to understand your variables and there's variables like heat and substrate and what plants and fish are in there and that's all great but it's really a fun, engaging hobby when you know, like, oh, if I put some phosphorus in, that yellow spotting on on the uh, on the uh, autosantern uh, nymphaea um, is going to, or the nymphaea autosantern uh will go away, and I'll get more of a true, like, banana yellow rather than a yellowish, like, unhealthy yellow. Or that the leaf wilting in here is also, it's a phosphorus deficiency, uh, an iron deficiency, uh, you know, how things manifest. So maybe another video soon I'll talk about uh, how plants show off that they're having a problem. But for me, it's really cool to think about right now, this time of year, all the plants, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, are turning colors outside all the, I should say, all of the coniferous um, carnivorous? No, uh, deciduous. Sorry, guys, getting my mind twisted. Uh, plants are basically turning from uh, green to light green to yellow to orange or peach to red to dark red, and then the leaves fall off. And that is because the angle of the sun is coming at another direction. And chlorophyll, being green, absorbs certain bluer wavelengths of light and things, cooler waves of light. And as the sunset is peach and red, it syncs up with the sun being lower on the horizon and having to go through more of the atmosphere and losing certain rays of light. And that's also why these plants, in many cases, not exclusively, but it's why many of these plants have the same color palette of those things. And purple we'll throw in there for uh, another reason I'll talk about another time. But basically, it's from the angle of the slope. So pretend this is the edge of the water. 
Well, light in the rainforest may always come from this angle because there's forest trees right here. And so only out far in the water does it get light. And only at noon does it get straight down light. So maybe it only gets the wavelengths of a certain color from certain angles. And that's why it's sweet spot in a lake or a river um, changes the color of the leaves. Plus human interference, just making it more so that way. But I want to leave you guys with that kind of cool note, maybe. And uh, feel free to ask me anything else. Down the wormhole, hello, welcome. Sorry, I'm just headed out. Thanks, guys, for the like spike. Thank you so much for the uh, the super chat. That means a lot to me. Um, as I said, always appreciated. And... Uh, down the wormhole do you have any questions while you're here because i'm about to sign off we've kind of been talking about a little bit of chemistry water chemistry and plant chemistry and also algae and uh, shrimp whether fish and shrimp can get along and basically the the uh, takeaway is that yes you can have a shrimp tank with nano fish but actually nano fish are better at eating baby shrimp so if you're trying to sh hatch shrimp you either, you either better have a lot of hiding spots and a lot of shrimp to uh, reproduce or you want to have a shrimp hatchery and when you notice that a shrimp's pregnant, you take her out, put her in the hatchery, let her have her babies. I mean, I'll wait like a week or two if I can tell which shrimp it is or if she's out on the same plant or something and that way she's only in the hatchery for two weeks or something. Once she hatches, I take her right back and put her right back in, and then I wait for her babies to grow, and then I'll throw half of them in here and leave half of them in the hatchery just to keep the ecosystem the same there. Now, the last note I want to touch on today is that the other day I trimmed a bunch of my tanks really heavily, and that is another reason why we're getting algae here, and that's because I took away plant life, and all of that free uh, fertilizers all the free fertilizers that were in the water were available and the light immediately the phosphorus specifically grabbed onto that and said let's make hair algae or you know slimy algae or algae and that's what it did in this tank it made a lot of it and so i'm going to have to hand remove it get the water with the phosphorus out and, uh, you know, also ammonia, things like that um, are part of it. But the plants in here had taken the nitrates down so far that I reintroduced nitrates and nitrogen into the, the circuit so that I could get some brighter colors in here along with the iron. Because I had iron, but I didn't have enough carbon in the form of CO2 for the iron to even be effective because your CO2, as I said earlier, is like a open parking lot within your plant. And you can either fill it with cars, which is new sprouts of leaves. Each parking lot filled is a new leaf coming off. Or you can spruce up your mall with repair trucks, but they need that parking lot. And so the CO2 is the parking lot and all the other uh, various car you know the and by co2 i really mean the carbon in, in co2 that plants disassemble because uh, it's the easiest place to get carbon because fish breathe it out plants uh respire it also with carbon that they're done with as they're recycling carbon things like that at nighttime um yeah that's also why you turn your co2 off at night is because plants are letting their co2 off whereas in the day they're letting oxygen off um I saw a question. Lorena, uh, five-gallon tank shrimp only, or could you get some fish in it? Five gallons seems too little for any fish, in my opinion, but I'm curious to hear your opinion. Uh, Lorena, I would say that's up to you. I, I've i definitely done it both ways. I have a lot of fun watching shrimp. I, I don't know why, Um I used to not really like shrimp and think they were like little bugs or cockroaches or something. But now I really enjoy watching them like play around. And so I would either get one type of shrimp and put it in there or several species. And then you can tailor it to that if you're used to keeping shrimp. Otherwise, just get cherry shrimp or blue dreams or orange 
I'd say get blue, red, yellow, or orange. Uh, don't bother with the greens, and um, I guess Rileys are okay, or Rileys. Uh, that's with the clear section. But the carbons, uh, the black ones, and the chocolate ones, and the uh, ones, a lot of people have problems keeping them. Plus, they just don't have reliable uh, color in their in their species now five gallons is even kind of small for shrimp believe it or not they could live in a cup of water i'm saying but they the ecosystem works better the bigger it is and the bigger the space is the more surface area you have and that's what the shrimp are eating they're eating alfuks which are if you can see it there's actually this kind of grime on the glass and that is what a lot of things including my little panda loaches are eating by the way up here that's a grown panda loach that almost you could call it like a chain loach instead but that's already a different loach and there's the babies which are the perfect stripes um but they're eating that and that's what shrimp like to eat also as well as decaying and dead things and um you know algae which is also part of what's growing on the sides so i would recommend um if you can, like my, I mean, I know you're probably debating getting one tank. If I had one five gallon tank and that's all I could have, I would put some nano fish in there and I would go super nano. I would go for like these blue axle rod eyes that look almost like neon tetras, but they're very small. Um, they poop hardly any amount. Like it's just this teeny little grain of sand. It's seriously like the size of three grains of sugar. And so you could have probably 10 or 15 or 20 of those in a five gallon. And I'm not kidding. Um, but I would, whatever you do, I'd put a lot of plants in it. Um, maybe slow growing plants it for most of it. And then pick one corner to put some quicker growing plants that are pretty. Uh, you could use like limnophilia or pogo stamens or rotalas, things like that. But then I would use maybe Anubius or Swords or Bucephalandra just for the sake of not um, not having to worry about things, not having to trim things and throw off the equilibrium of the tank all the time. Because, you know, if you cut away 20% of the plants all of a sudden, which I did in this tank, even trimming them, even though they'll grow back out and it'll even out, Right now, I have a big algae bloom. In a five-gallon tank, this is a 17-gallon. In a five-gallon tank, that's going to be even more pronounced. And when you have shrimp or something like that, that's where you can run into problems if one of the variables is thrown off like that. So either get – I mean, cherry shrimp are pretty bulletproof now. You can get some really beautiful cherry shrimp for very inexpensive. Um, I would feel fine with cherry shrimp in there, and you'll probably get some babies as – but you want, it's all about how you set up your tank. You definitely want like some cracks and crevices and then like a rock pile. I have a video if you search my channel. Uh, Lucas Bretz also has a great video. I think Rob from Flip Aquatics might too. But get some ideas from us on uh, like choya wood or rocks. You start a pile with big rocks and then you sprinkle some little ones and then a few more big ones around it and then plant around that maybe moss on top of that, or you get something like um, Sawasertong, Servasertong, which I have a video on also, um, if you want to know the crazy history of that and what it has to do with Darwin. Uh, but basically, that is another great hiding spot, or Naja grass, but then you've got something floating. But if you, if you have some floating, like rooster tail or water cabbage uh, or water lettuce up top, and something in the corner like moss that uh, the shrimp can kind of hide on and also pick just little crustaceans and mini teeny, um, you know, protozoa and stuff like that out of there, um, you, you'll be fine. And you could put blue dreams or red cherry shrimp in there. I would start with a group, honestly. They have almost no bio footprint, so I would put like 10 in there. 10 in there even if it's a five gallon um or whatever you can afford they do like groups though they do better they will breed better in a group even if it's just one doing the breeding but put like 10 of them in there and then what you could do is you could get like um 
you know what would be great is uh, clown killifish. Those hang out up top, uh, and they hang out up here. They're beautiful. Look up rocket killifish or clown killifish. I think I have a video on that, too. Um, those are a great fish that kind of mind their business up top, and then, you know, you could have one auto sinkless, and then you could also still have room for uh, pick like a rasbora you like. So maybe six to ten chili rasboras or lime rasboras. Lime rasboras get, is getting a little bit big, but these axelrod blue rasboras that are this blue and purple color, um, that's full grown. They're not even an inch. They make like no waste. That's going to work all just fine. Um, and just, you know, put as many plants as you can in there um, to be eating up the excess nutrients to cycle the tank. And really, for success with shrimp, the biggest thing for success, whether it's a small tank or a big tank, is to season that tank. And that means to just have it growing biological little goodies and algae and things like that even if your tank looks beautiful and the water looks clear when you look under a microscope i can guarantee you that even my clearest tanks are full of just like little algae little tardy grades or water bears little tiny critters that both your shrimp and your small fish and fry will eat so that's my recommendation is if you know if you're gonna do shrimp uh, do a neocaridina of some sort or a you know they're not as pretty but a um, malawa shrimp or malawa shrimp m a l a w a there's I've done some videos on them they're in this tank as well um, but you can really cram a five gallon full of a hundred shrimp if you felt like it if they have enough bio uh you know enough biofilm and uh food to eat and you shouldn't have to feed shrimp pellet type food very often honestly they should survive without it almost in your tank ideally but uh for good color for breeding for the health of molting in their shells getting a good pellet really makes ensures that like they don't get stuck molting and they don't have um like a keratin uh, deficiency or something along those lines uh, or calcium deficiency. So yeah, I would get one sucker or cleaner fish if you want, a small auto sinkless or something if you need it, you know, if you really feel the urge. Uh, and then I would get somewhere between six and 10 small rasboras, be it chili rasboras, phoenix rasboras, exclamation point rasboras, axelrod rasboras, something that size that's literally like three-fourths of an inch and skinny. Um, tetras and things like that, people think of those as nanofish, but one, they're quick, they have a fast metabolism, they eat quite a bit, and uh, you know, guppies people think of also, but those e eat and nip shrimp babies like none other and they can poop up a storm they're kind of a messy fish uh i mean relatively speaking they're not but they are in the nano world so that's my advice for you i hope it helps um uh your cherry your cherry shrimp tank is getting overrun by snails uh pull them out that's what i would do just put a piece of zucchini or, or cucumber in there, like a slice of it, weight it down, turn the lights off for four hours, come back, and you'll have like 80% of your snails in there. But one question is, why do you want to get rid of your snails? Um, if they're ram's horn snails, I wouldn't worry too much. Pond snails or bladder snails, the little spirally looking ones. Not that big of a deal. Uh, Malaysian trumpet snails aren't a bad thing at all because they turn up the substrate. They burrow and bury themselves every day and night. Um, so if you have a few Malaysian trumpet snails, the long conical ones that are kind of pointy, uh, those are fine. Um, and if it's in a shrimp tank, they shouldn't be getting fed at a rate that they're 
growing exponentially. If they are, you're overfeeding. And the fact that you have a bunch of snails in your shrimp tank kind of indicates that maybe you're overfeeding, which I'm not chastising you or saying that's the end of the world or a problem, just saying that like they could be doing with less if there's enough food for all of the shrimps and snails and probably planaria or whatever else is in the water uh, and in the substrate to be eating and be full. So that's my advice. Give them to somebody with a puffer fish if you can, uh, or you can always just, you know, flush them or whatever. All right, you guys have a wonderful day. Feel free to watch this again or watch the video on how everything is connected and dust storms in Africa create hurricanes in America and the Caribbean and they bring all, which is kind of cool, all the phosphorus, nitrogen, and carbon uh, that is needed for a year of growth in the Amazon is brought over and then um, either created by lightning that is caused by weather patterns uh, created and set up off the coast of Africa or actual dust in the atmosphere which allows rain to form and then allows lightning and ice pellets to form in the upper atmosphere uh, and then it falls the dust falls into the river and into the forest and literally the the amount of phosphorus dust that it falls in the Amazon is lost out to sea every year and so that floats down around the, the world in into salt water systems helps the salt water systems and oddly enough why is the bodell depression full of phosphorus well it's because it has a bunch of limestone and dead critters that had uh phosphorus um, and phosphates in them that died three four five hundred million years ago at the bottom of the ocean and that bed, that sandy, dusty area in the Sahara Desert that heats up so hot is made up of crust shells that have been under pressure for many, many millions of years and are now exposed through erosion and wind. So it's this huge, crazy circle of life. But it also explains where a lot of the, the chemicals that we use uh, and atomic elements we use carbon and nitrogen as i've harped on that a few times but i want people to understand this it's imperative for if you want to play with the variables of aquascaping or with your tank and understand it truly uh it's all tied and it's all to your fish too so you guys thank you for being awesome viewers having great questions ask me more questions anytime join me on facebook whatever you would like to do i am there for you and uh, I'm also on Patreon if uh, I've helped you out and you want to contribute to the channel. That's also a, a great way. Raccoon Creek Aquatics, you did miss it. Fishy Snowman, you did too. I am so sorry, but I've got to get out of here. Um, we got to get out of this place if it's the last thing we ever do. So uh, watch the replay. Much love to everyone. Take care. I'll be back soon. Um, I might do like a middle of the night cast for those in like Australia and England and things. I've been getting requests for that. But if you have ideas for casts, I mean, I always just kind of ramble and go wherever it takes me. But, uh, you know, I kind of stayed on topic this time. Uh, I will talk to you all later. Take care, you guys. Take care of your fish, your plants, your tank, the people around you, and it will come back to you tenfold in the end uh much love peace and have a great week all right guys i will talk to you later uh if you need to get a hold of me for more help and you're here at the end just message me in the comments and i'll be there for you all right take care guys maybe this thing